The Battle of Marinesco. The strikers grew frustrated due to their failure attempts to provide the jobbers from operating without them. The deputies and state police were just wanting one more rock-throwing incident. Just four days earlier, the Wakefield News maintained a dozen armed and determined state police would have put down the rebellion in short order at Marinesco. Tensions began to mount. At 11.30 a.m. on the 30th of June, more than 300 lumberjacks, hiding in the grass along the road, attacked a convoy of five trucks belonging to the Avery Anon and, and the western limits of Marinesco. At the summit of the five logging trucks belonging to the... At the summit of the slope leading out of the village... Shots were fired over the heads of the mob as they threw rocks at the trucks and state police, led by Sergeant A.J. Hayden. Some drivers and officers reportedly suffered cuts and bruises, but no one was injured in the shooting. Tear gas was used to disperse the strikers. When one looks closely at what happened on this day, the argument may be made that what was an attack by rock-throwing lumberjacks ended in a police riot. There were about 30 sheriff's deputies and state police at the scene. By definition, a police riot is when roving bands of policemen set upon provocative persons in an excessively violent manner. Witnesses to this event gave testimony to the Governor's Committee of Marinesco on the 8th of July, 1937, and described numerous incidents of bystanders being set upon and hauled off, not just by police officers, but also by loggers. People in Marinesco came to have been looked down upon for their support of the lumberjacks and became fair game. Bob Anderson gave an account of one of the rock-throwing assaults on logging trucks that took place in June of 1937. I was in high school, and one day I walked down to the railroad tracks, and there were lumberjacks there were on the hill where Mark Whitley lives today. They had piled rocks there, and when the trucks came, there would be a logging truck, a car of police, another logging truck, a car of police, and so on. The lumberjacks threw rocks at the trucks and broke some windshields. The police, mostly state police, came bolted out of their cars with clubs and tear gas, and they were shooting tear gas at the guys. The wind was just right, and it came over the railroad tracks, so I got tear gas at the same time. My eyes were running, and it was hard to breathe. They beat those lumberjacks up with clubs, split their heads open. John Clemens was staying at the hotel. He was just down there out of curiosity. They split his head open, too, even though he was just a I remember these guys, Dutch, in the corner, really please heck for the way they treated innocent bystanders. They almost hauled him to jail for it. Walter Johnson was one of the fifty president of America. Out of the trucks, police got picked. At White, they said, "Let's get him, help him, and, the, and knock two guys down." I went for the third guy. Rat Soprani hit me on the head. Cops got me down. West in the ribs. They had, I want to have, hit me with a. Gebbit County, and had lived in Marinesco since 1987. He was a tavern operator that became the Lumberjacks He was in bed when his wife Rita came into the room and told him, there's a bunch of state men and I'm down the street. We're ten dressed. So I'll see what about. He went over to Mike Bishko's and the officers spotted him. One big the let's grab him. One of them pushed him off the sidewalk and gave me a second to the gate. It busted the t- let him go. He entered Michigan. Cannon was sitting down drinking his coffee when Clinton and two other officers came in and punched him in the stomach and drove me out into the street. Go out and get into a truck, he testified. I saw that there was fresh in the truck and said, wait a minute, let's go easy. I don't want to get my clothes full of paint. The officers began swearing and forced him to get in. Later as Mickey and Anderson. His wife attempted to where he was taken away, but sidewalk. Stay there if I didn't want to be loaded in the truck, too. It'll take more than you to put me on it. Them. It's a fine thing when citizen and taxpayer can't even stand on the sidewalk. You don't want treatment. You have taxes years, one of the police told her. I've just paid my taxes only last month. I paid 154 cents. I am not a communist. She had a gun in one hand and a club in the other. Which the Carson and the others used was something terrible. The club was good. Unidentified Jack always ate at Hoodick's in Marinesco. During the roundup, some state troopers came in and asked him what he was doing. And threw him out the front door before he finished it to pay for it. He was brought to the barracks in Wakefield. Richard Godfrey, a 58 year old, worked in Marinesco for two years, was a bystander during the battle. He was struck on the lip by a tear gas canister. 
The police caught him and kicked and punched him before he got away. They recaptured him and loaded him on the truck with other prisoners. My eyes swollen my door. My lips still burn, he reported one week later. Elsie Woodward was staying at her mother's place during the strike and walked over to her house to check on it during the battle. I saw some police beating a man in my yard. I think they were kicking me. the police, stop pounding that man. He didn't anything. You're harboring a destructive person, they told her. Any man in my yard isn't destroying anything. They threw a tear gas bomb towards her, burning her lip. They put Mr. Godfrey in the car, and his nose was bleeding and sober his eyes. He asked for a handkerchief. The police would not to come near enough to give it to him, so she threw it to him. As soon as Godfrey wiped his eyes, the policeman grabbed her handkerchief and tossed it back towards Mr. Mrs. Woodward, saying, Here's a souvenir. He told me if I didn't shut up, he would put mine, me in the car, too. While I was talking to the police, Godfrey ran away. About seven or eight policemen finally found him on the railroad track. They told me not to go into the house. They were shooting at him. I don't know if it was just blanks or not. They had riot sticks, too. Charles O'Toole was a caretaker for Harold Ormus, employed to the cake care for his cottage on Lake Gogebic. One day at the Battle of Marinesco, O'Toole wasn't feeling very well and came into town. I was walking down the street and met a couple of ladies I knew. We stopped and talked while well, a bunch of state police came along, swinging their clubs, and the ladies got scared and ran. These police were running around like crazy, running and swinging clubs at them. I also heard them swearing. I hurried away, and there were uh, three state police behind me. I guess I wasn't moving fast enough to suit one of them, for he said, keep moving, and I said, I'm moving as fast as I can. Well, he hit me across the back with the handle of a club. After he hit me, he said, I'm sorry I'd done that, and went off. I crippled up in legs a little and had a slight stroke last spring. Casper Keogh was one of the lumberjacks who witnessed the Battle of Marinesco and gave testimony to the governor's committee. He was 55 years old in Gogebic County for 14 years by 1937. The cops were firing shots all over. They are beating up, men up. I didn't want any trouble, so I went home to my room in the mill. There I sat on the steps. Two policemen walked up and asked, Are you a striker? Yes, I am. You better get out of town, they told him. I don't have to get out of town. I live here, he replied. One of the police struck him with a three and a half foot long club. Pretty soon, three men came uh, along and joined in. They kept hitting me in the same place, in the muscles of the leg. They had a truck nearby and told me to get in it. Keo refused. Left. I know they intended to come back and get me. I mooched along the highway over to where I eat my meal there for a while. I was coming out the side door when I noticed a couple of cops. I went back in and went ba out the back door. The cops were loading the trucks. At the corner of the building, there was a little shed. I went in. Meantime, nearby, there were rounding up eight or ten men. They came within three or four feet of me, but the cops didn't see me. After they had gone, I watched them from the yard while they loaded their trucks. Julius Cusisto was one of the lumberjacks who stayed on the Pavlovich property during the strike and was among those all arrested and taken to Bessemer. He had been employed at Camp Boniface. One lumberjack was called Humpy because of a slight hump on his back. During one of the encounters between the strikers and the police, Humpy and his partner had to the Prescott escape. His friend later told him, you sure you weren't crippled then? Mary Pavlovich was outside her home, walking her with her baby in her arms when the battle between police and lumberjacks took place. I saw some men running down the highway and into my yard. Art Pertile and three or four police were some men clubbing and trying to get them into the truck. I told Art Pertile to get out of my yard and let those men alone. He raised the club and told me to shut my mouth. She said that he told her, if you were a man, I would hit you. She testified, he probably would have struck me if he didn't have the baby in my arms. When he got out of my yard, he called me a communist and a lot of bad names. He told me not to let those men in my yard. I said I would let them. He flagged a car that came along with 10 or 11 police in it. They stopped and pushed me and the baby into the gate and ran through my property, chasing jacks ahead of them into the woods like they were animals. Miss Pavlovich said she saw Lawrence Peterson, a logger, hitting a man with an axe handle and took away from him. Keep out of this, he told her. He took back his club. He was driving the men down the sidewalks with cops around them. The sheriff came into my yard and said to him, This isn't right to treat those men like animals. He said he couldn't do anything about it. I said, Well, then you're a mighty poor sheriff. So he called. Some of the police had caught some of the men. They kept beating them at every step. He said, Boys, you've gone a little too far. Some of the men had to wait across the river. A lot of them didn't come back till 11 o'clock at night. There been 40 and 50 policemen around town, and the Jacks were scared. Jumbo were 10 related. Police were running around all looking for the men to fill with the truck. They didn't. They met a truck. I don't know where it was coming from. The police hollered, where do you guys think you were going? 
Richard Kosky's boys drove his 1937 V8 truck to Marinesco on the 30th of June and were forced by the police to drive lumberjacks to the barracks in Wakefield. When police went past Mike Mishko's, they hollered, let's stop here more. Meanwhile, they were banging through the woods, shooting. Fertile was going around their state impounded the truck. State Police Pro Corporal Fred Ennis was a 41 years old at the time of the strike and a 12-year veteran of the Michigan State Police. On the day of Marinesco, Ennis told a reporter, I never saw so many rocks in my life. The newspaper reported one striker was knocked unconscious and many had sore ribs and other bruises. 40 strike, 46 strikers were arrested and brought to the State Police Post in Wakefield for printing and questioning. Another 500 strikers were reported to be lying in wait along US-2 between Bezos and Wood. 32 of the men arrested and 21 were citizens. After the lumberjack and bystanders arrived at the police barracks of Wakefield, Benny Novick opened the door and exclaimed, Hey, look what we got, according to Ino Wurton, and the rat soprani called a fellow down from the truck. He was a lumberjack named Newt Nelson who later testified that there were 40, about 46 of us in the truck. I was the first one to jump down, and as soon as I jumped down, the state and country, county police jumped on me. They hit me in the eye, and I couldn't see anymore. I fell on the sidewalk and never said a word to anybody. Nelson was beaten, one of the policemen said. Let him lay there. That's good enough for the rat, according to Wirtanen. The Ironwood Daily Club reported Nelson pled guilty to molesting and interfering with truck drivers at a public highway and was given 30 days in the county jail. Nelson told the governor's committee that the police wanted me to plead guilty for disturbing the peace. We had a trial. We didn't plead guilty. We were suspended for 90 days. The cops said to get out of the county. I was here two years, and he said he could chase me out. Rotanen was the last man. When I got inside the barracks, I felt nervous. One of the other police said, let's take him to the garage and give him the works. The other said, let's go to the Gooseneck Kartsanen was one of the policemen. Mickey was the one that wanted to give him the works. I asked to see the prosecuting attorney. He said, I'll see you after a while. Car Sanon came over to me and said, I got a good notion to turn you over to the mob. I said, what mob? He said, we got a mob to work. It's necessary. And I, at that, I didn't say anything. John Stenner, 64, was arrested in Marinesco. He was coming towards the town in a truck, possibly with the Kosky boys, with the sheriff. I'd hitchhiked from Montanagan. The cops took us to Wakefield. They held us three days in the barracks at Wakefield. There were 20 of us. One of hit me below the head kick me. One man hit and hit his head on the sidewalk. We had the cement. There were two bunks in each side. The rest took our parts, though. Rattanen was placed in the county jail in Bessemer, fingerprinted by the state police. He had, turned, he had to turn over his money, $9. They kept the $5 bill and gave me back four ones. I stayed in jail about 72 hours. There were no, no trials. I asked to see the sheriff. I said I was laying around. I wanted to get out of there. I wanted them to put up a charge and let me out on bail. The sheriff came to see me and then told me he would help me get in touch with the prosecutor. A few minutes after, I saw the prosecutor come into the office. Later, at about 11.20, the sheriff came up and said, Your wife wants to see you downstairs. Get your hat and your coat. I went down. My wife said, Funny, they haven't got a number and stripes on you yet. You're so notorious. He finally got out of He testified that he had no connection with the strikers and intended to go out. I don't feel safe in this part of the country. All except a few of the men were released in the 3rd of July. There was an unconfirmed story about an unidentified run back. He set himself up in the upstairs of Mike Mishko's tavern in Marinesco during the strike. He said to have been armed with the first World War machine gun. It is instead upstairs waiting for loggers' trucks to drive to town. The story, lumberjacks stopped the trucks before they got that far.